Hello and welcome to Quadriga. This week's European Union summit was set to be dominated by a deepening political crisis over immigration. Whether a compromise can be found and its outcome could decide the fate of Germany's governing coalition and ultimately of the European Union itself. But there was little that the member countries agreed on going into the summit, save one point that stronger measures are needed to tighten Europe's external borders and to strengthen the Coast Guard Frontex. A new government in Italy says it will no longer be Europe's refugee camp and is turning away boats carrying exhausted refugees. Is the EU throwing its long-standing humanitarian principles overboard? Migrant crisis, time for Fortress Europe? That's our topic here on Quadriga. Here are our guests. Monica Guaracci is the director of the German section of the International Organization for Migration in Berlin, and she says arrivals are drastically lower across the Mediterranean, yet the sense of panic and crisis is at an all-time high. Now is the time to go beyond a crisis footing and forge a long-term humane policy with migrants recognized as people, not numbers. And it's a pleasure to welcome Ragida Banam to the program. She is a freelance journalist from Lebanon, and she says the crisis Europe is facing now is partly a refusal of its act, to act early on what was happening in Syria during the early days of the revolution. And also great to have with us Thorsten Brenner. He's co-founder and director of the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin. He says the migration issue has long stopped being mainly about refugees. It's now a tool in the fight for political power and identity in Europe, a fight that has the potential to lead to an implosion of the European Union. So welcome to all of you. I'd like to start out by picking up on your opening statement, uh, Monica Gracci, because in fact, arrivals are very definitely lower. According to the UNHCR, the High Commission on Refugees, sea arrivals in 2017 were at 170,000, more or less. That's down by half of what it was in 2016 and by 83% compared to 2015. So given those numbers, where is this sense of crisis coming from? What's driving it? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for having IOM in, in the show. I think that it comes from 2015, basically. It's still, we, since 2015, we have addressed, Europe has addressed the situation in a crisis mode continuously. We have been speaking about the need to have long-term solutions, to look at integration, to look at uh, legal migration pathways that go beyond, um, uh, beyond resettlement and relocation, such as labour migration schemes, etc. But nothing of that has actually happened. And in, in terms of arrivals, actually, the burden still is a lot on the front states, such as Italy. And this is why it is important to, uh, to, to review uh, Dublin and to have an equal sharing. There has not been an equal sharing of responsibility among all the member states. Dublin being the treaty that regulates both registration and distribution of refugees trying to enter Europe. And I want to come back to that and the burden sharing a bit uh, later. But let me come to you, Torsten Brenner, because you said in your opening statement that this crisis really isn't about migration itself, but about, uh, essentially about politics. And that seems to be occurring, oddly enough, not only in Europe, but in the United States at the same time. Why are we seeing this shift to what you refer to as identity? politics or even tribalism right now? Because there have been very successful political entrepreneurs exploiting the migration issue for their political gain. Uh, you can see, you know, pointed to the US, President Trump has been been doing this. Uh, the AFD in Germany, uh, the Prime AfD, Minister the, the far right, the, party, the far right in uh, party in Germany, Prime Minister Orban, they've been extremely successful and they've rattled uh, the establishment parties and they're scrambling to catch up. So it's the aftershocks, in, in a sense, the political aftershocks of 2015 that we're experiencing now in Germany. We're experiencing in Italy, which had been, you know, has long been at the front line of uh, receiving mi irregular migrants. Uh, 
in Europe and that has finally elected a government that says no longer, we will not no longer be the country uh, that uh, receives uh, most of the migrants and we will turn the boats uh, away. So this is culminating into a, a political crisis in Europe. It's very domestically driven by political entrepreneurs who exploit uh, this issue and the public sentiment uh, that there's a crisis. And in Germany, for example, yes, uh, the numbers have gone down, but we do have a a slight administrative crisis domestically in terms of dealing with returns of rejected asylum seekers. The system is not working. The Dublin system is still in, in shadows. So there are things to be fixed. Again, I want to come back to where that system isn't working. But uh, just one question about the German domestic political situation, because you mentioned the far right party, the AFD. But in fact, uh, the party currently stirring up a lot of trouble and possibly willing to bring the whole government down is the chancellor's Bavarian conservative sister party, the CSU. What's going on there? But they're terrified of losing their majority in Bavaria, their absolute majority. There's elections in Bavaria, uh, the AFD is making headway. For three years, the sister party, the Bavarian sister party uh, of uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel has railed against Merkel's refugee policy, has, says, has said this is the biggest mistake, we will... But they've only protested and they haven't actually implemented any changes. And they, they say their credibility is on the line and now we have to put a stop sign because they're facing elections in, in Bavaria. So it's very much driven by the fear of the alter, alternative for Germany right-wing uh, party, what, uh, what they are doing. And of course could bring down a government that's only been in power for uh, a little over three months. Ragina Banham, in her first statement to the parliament after the new government uh, came into place, uh, the chancellor, Chancellor Merkel, said that it had been a grave error not to see that the war in Syria would have drastic consequences for Europe. When you look at where Europe stands today, at the current debate that's going on, do you hold out any hope that a summit like the one currently taking place can remedy that error going forward? To be honest, I think it's a bit too late because when we're talking now about the migration crisis in Europe and in Germany, we're always referring to 2015. Migration has always happened in Europe. Uh, people from poorer countries have always come across to the continent. And there wasn't really, I mean, it was a problem, but it wasn't as big a problem as now. It wasn't threatening to uh, the governments to collapse. It wasn't threatening the unity of Europe. But when we're talking about 2015, is because we're talking about a mass migration that th hundreds of thousands, a million Syrians were allowed to cross into Germany. And well, now the Germans are looking at it and they're thinking, we can't cope with this, we can't deal with it. And this is why the current issue is, if the war in Syria was tackled before it was allowed to reach the breaking point and before all these people were running away from, you know, the massacres of the regime and, you know, the other terrorist organizations that uh, uh, found themselves there, the issue in Europe wouldn't have been, wouldn't have gone that far, I think. Let us perhaps take a look at the treaty that we've mentioned several times that is supposed to regulate immigration into Europe. Uh, you mentioned the million who crossed in 2015. They entered Germany partly because that treaty, the Dublin Treaty, was suspended by Hungary and other countries which simply couldn't cope with the number of refugees they were supposed to register at the time. Let's take a closer look at the Dublin Treaty and where things stand. The Dublin Regulation is an EU law that determines which member state is responsible for reviewing asylum applications. In principle, refugees must request asylum from the state in which they first entered the European Union. Right now, most of the refugees cross the Mediterranean Sea to get to Greece or Italy. Both countries feel overwhelmed by the influx of migrants and asylum seekers. Many of these people would like to move on to northern European countries like Germany or Sweden. But some countries have threatened to send the refugees back to the EU state where they landed. Italy says that's not fair and demands that the refugees be distributed more equitably among EU countries. Germany has registered about 1.3 million asylum seekers so far. Still, does this mean the end of the Dublin regulation? 
Certainly, Italy would say it ought to mean the end of the Dublin rules. Monica Goracci, uh, Italy is proposing that they simply be uh, jettisoned and uh, that uh, Europe adopt a new system. So, two questions to you also as an Italian. First of all, has Italy borne a disproportionate share of the burden? Has it been left in the lurch by other countries? And secondly, um, who is looking for what in this current debate? Take us through it briefly, if you would. Um, yes, Italy has a point because it has been uh, the frontline state and there has not been uh, an equal uh, sharing of, uh, of the responsibility. The new proposal uh, that is with the European Parliament looks at uh, the possibility for refugees to uh, put forward their asylum claims not only or not necessarily in the first uh, country of entry. And this gives the possibility to have a, a different uh, sharing, actually. Um, I would like to give also another number uh, that shows that, uh, that we were going into the right direction, and that is a number that Frontex gave recently, talking about returns. Frontex, just let's remind people, is that coastal um, guard that is... The European such, border, yeah. yes. And uh, uh, they um, gave recently a figure that says that in 2017, more people have returned or been returned in whatever way, forcefully, voluntarily, than people have come in. So we were on the right place. It takes time, though. And, and this, is, uh, this is what we'll uh, need to, to look at and, uh, and to give this possibility. Coming back to the burden-sharing point, Torsten uh, Brenner, shouldn't it have been clear from the inception? I mean, the Dublin rules were signed in 1990. Shouldn't it have been clear from the inception that it was, this was not a workable system, that it put all the burden on these frontline countries? I mean, the sense here in Germany is that Germany's borne the brunt of it all. But in fact, Italy didn't get a lot of help. That's true. And when Italy, and it should have been clear at least from 2010, 2011 onwards, when Italy was actually saying this Dublin system is not working for us, uh, we have an increase uh, in, in migrants coming to us and help us. And the German interior ministry minister, a CSU Bavarian politician at, at the time said, no, Italy, you deal with this. We will not change the rules because Germany was not uh, at the receiving end. And it's only after Germany decided to accept a disproportionate number of refugees in 2015, actually to save the pressure that was on Europe uh, at, at the time, that we're saying we need to change the system. And uh, we first of all thought uh, we should have a mandatory quota and to, to force Hungary and other countries that don't want refugees to take them in. That backfired spectacularly. So right now the consensus in Germany, I think, is that there should be a, a fair system of sharing, but countries should be able to opt out uh, of receiving uh, refugees within, within Europe and then instead pay a, a disproportionate share of border control or pay other countries that are taking in a disproportionate share of migrants. But we now agree with Italy that the, the frontline states, the, the, the border states, shouldn't uh, be left alone dealing with arrivals. We, in this case, being uh, Germany, the German sorry, government. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, Regida Banham, just uh, to put the burdens uh, in context, as it were, and also looking beyond the Dublin rules, which of course only apply to the European Union, to international law, it foresees or mandates keeping refugees as close as possible to their home countries. That is international law, uh, so to speak. Tell us what that means for a country like Lebanon. Remind us, please, of how many refugees your country has taken in and what share they make up of the population. Well, Lebanon has a population of uh, 6 million people. Out of those 6 million, 4 million are Lebanese, or 3.5 million. And Nearly two million or one and a half million are senior Syrian refugees that were, you know, uh, that came after 2015. And half a million are Palestinian refugees who came, you know, tens of years ago uh, when, you know, the Israel, Israel state was uh, established. And those Palestinians are still in Lebanon in refugee camps. Uh, the hope now is that the Syrian refugees, who are newcomers in comparison to the Palestinians, uh, will one day go back to Syria and will not end up in the same situation as the Palestinians. Uh, you know, also what makes things uh, even more complicated and difficult for Lebanon is the fact that it's 
supposed to be half Christian and half Muslims, and they are supposed to rule together. And any uh, attempt to uh, uh, annoy this balance uh, of governance or, or population is seen very, uh, is taken very badly by politicians. Uh, you know, especially now that the Syrian refugees are mostly Muslims. So it is stirring a lot of uh, kind of hatred feelings towards the Syrian refugees in Lebanon, which is uh, not a good place and it's affecting the care uh, that is provided to uh, the refugees. And just briefly, Lebanon is a very poor country, of course. Is it getting the kind of financial support and help that it needs to deal with this amazing uh, uh, share of its population? Well, of course, it is, it is getting some support from uh, the EU and from the UN uh, uh, in terms of education and uh, health uh, towards the refugees. But as you said, Lebanon is a poor country and already suffers from a lot of problems, uh, uh, corruption and uh, a lot of other problems on the government level uh, that are reflecting now and getting bigger uh, with you know the population getting bigger also uh, and are getting harder to tackle uh, and with the same political uh, uh, po po politicians being there and not having a plan a specific plan into tackling their own problems uh, so you adding burden to a burden that is already difficult to deal with and you know problems are just piling up with no solution in, in, in sight. Tuastin Beda, where does public opinion stand here? We were talking about the Bavarian Conservative Party and its attempt to essentially win votes with this anti-immigrant course. Would you say here too there is now a surge of opinion, of hostility about refugees? Certainly the welcoming culture uh, that supposedly all Germans subscribed to in 2015, that's gone. And I think uh, the majority of the, if you look at uh, how the population is segmented, I think 20% are open, welcoming, and they think it's the greatest thing that we are becoming a more diverse country. 20% are incre incredibly hostile and think this is, uh, means our country is going down the drain. And the other 60%, they're split. They want more control of who's coming in. And they think uh, 2015 was an exceptional situation that should not be repeated. But they also think we shouldn't close, our, close ourselves off completely. They don't think we should turn Muslims, especially into scapegoats uh, for all the ills in, in our society, which the right wing is, uh, is doing, and uh, they also think that we shouldn't act unilaterally in Europe. So right now, the CSU has quite a lot of support in saying, we need to be able to return those migrants that are denied asylum. Uh, so 60% of Germans think that's true. We should also, uh, a lot of Germans think we should make it less attractive to come here and have in-kind support instead of cash, uh, cash support. Uh, but a majority of Germans also doesn't want to act unilaterally and jeopardize the Schengen system and the, of, of border free travel and the European Union. Monica Guracci, unilateral versus multilateral action. That is the essence of the debate here within Germany, but also, of course, within the EU as a whole. They're going to be looking at this in the summit currently taking place, whether they can find some sort of multilateral approach. Meanwhile, the Bavarian conservative leader, Mr. Seehofer, the interior minister of Germany, says, look, we simply have to move forward unilaterally because we're not going to get a multilateral solution that works. What's wrong with that? What he's proposing to do essentially is only uh, part of the Dublin Treaty, namely send back people who were registered in Italy to the place where they were registered. But there is a basic principle of non-refoulement, that is the not possibility to send uh, people back at the border, that is... Um, that is tricky in this situation. And I think that we have to... I mean, there needs to be a multilateral response. Migration affects different countries, so it cannot be dealt with uh, unilaterally and uh, bilaterally. Um, but I think we have to also go back, probably, and look at the impact of the economic crisis on Europe many years ago. Prior to that, there were several labour migration schemes, bilateral schemes within the, between the countries, and those have all stopped. And, and I think that what has failed also in this time is, uh, is the focus on integration. And we have to rethink integration, because that's fundamental. And integration should look at vulnerable people in the community beyond migrants and beyond refugees. 
many were impacted by the economic crisis. And then, so it's easy for them to see the refugees coming and the migrants coming with special needs and special attention. And they say, what is our needs? What happened to us? I think that integration, no, no solution of strengthening the borders, uh, controlling migration will be effective if we don't include integration policies, hard work on integration policies and labour migration schemes. Because most of the people who are coming are economic migrants, plus there is a group of migrants that are vulnerable, that are victims of trafficking and accompanied minors for whom there is no system for the moment to come into Europe. So this is also a reason why processing needs to be done in Europe to grant those people protection because they are, have the right to protection in the European countries. Regie Ranem, if I look at the current uh, solutions being proposed uh, for an overall approach uh, to a multilateral approach. They include strengthening the outer boundaries of Europe. That seems to be one of the few things that uh, most people uh, can agree on, most European Union leaders. And there's also talk of essentially outsourcing the problem by creating migrant processing centers out in other countries like Northern Africa, like, for example, Libya, one of the transit countries uh, that many refugees pass through. Does that sound to you like a workable way to keep, for example, Syrian refugees from trying to get to Europe's shores? I mean, first you have to uh, you have to have the agreement of those countries in North Africa to host those detention or those uh, transfer centers. Uh, and if you get the agreement of those countries, which till now is still not known and Libya, from what I understood, has rejected, uh, you still have to convince or you still have to look at if those people are going to go to those centres and uh, sit there in unknown conditions. I mean, we've seen what's happened in Libya. We've, we were all shocked when uh, the pictures of uh, Africans being sold as slaves, uh, 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 you know, in Libya. And by the way, it's still happening till now because the world has forgotten, it seems, uh, Nothing has been done. Uh, uh, so are the Syrians or other refugees from other parts of Africa are going to go to those centres and wait there to be uh, met by a European official or UN official to be seen and then stay there for months in order to see if they're going to be accepted into Europe or not, or they're going to risk crossing the Mediterranean and getting into Europe uh, uh, and, you know, getting their case uh, heard here. Um, I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, it might be one of the solutions, but I think the Europeans are looking at this also in the wrong way. They're not looking at tackling the problems in their origin. They're just, you know, by talking about strengthening the borders, I mean, strengthening the borders, meaning what? Uh, you need to uh, solve the problems or help people stay in their country or tackle the smugglers or, I don't know, do something else than uh, those immediate solutions that seem to, uh, will do little to stop immigrants coming into Europe. You said at the outset of your remarks that, of course, the countries would have to agree. In fact, we have a quote from the Northern African Libyan uh, Deputy Prime Minister who is definitely not enthusiastic about the idea of migrant processing centers. Let's listen. We agree with the Europeans on many points related to illegal immigration. But we categorically reject the concept of migrant centers in Libya. It's against Libyan law. Such camps are not allowed under Libyan laws and regulations. Monica Garacci, you called in your opening statement for a long-term humane solution to the problem. Migrant processing centers offshore, tighter external boundaries. Is that that solution? What would that represent in terms of the likelihood of getting this problem, of getting a, a, a true solution to this challenge? No, for us, the solution is solidarity, is going back to the principle that founded the European Union, sharing of responsibilities and identifying a mechanism that brings together around the table and operationally all the countries around the Mediterranean plus the European Union countries and uh, identify a solution for legal migration schemes for migrants because that will continue. Europe needs migrant workers and so.
Tosta Benno, your opening statement referred to a possible implosion of the EU over this dispute. But the EU has long been adept at finding patchwork compromises that sort of kick the problem down the road. Would you expect that to happen here as well? And if so, what does that mean for the values of the European Union? I mean, it actually is a tough question to actually say we are true to our values because there's in the foreseeable future, the number of people who want to come to Europe will far exceed the number of people that European citizens are willing to accept. And we need to find uh, some sort of common sense, uh, humane way of dealing with uh, this gap. And that won't be easy, being true to our, and sticking uh, with our values doing that. Raghita Banham, in one sentence, if you would, Fortress Europe, would that truly de deter migrants? I don't think so. People are always looking for a better life and they think Europe can afford that. So I doubt it. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for joining in. See you soon.